for being here. It's a real honor to be back to amongst distinguished guests, friends, and really thank you, Space, for providing this space for us to think together, also as Arabs. I grew up thinking that I'll never have a conversation with Iraqi or Syrian or Lebanese, and here I am in Oslo talking to all three. Sometimes talking, not always. <laughs> so my, I apologize, I'm the boring academic of the group, so you'll have to endure a PowerPoint presentation as if you're in a lecture hall on a Friday night. But I really want to try to make some kind of argument about what home and homeland mean in the Palestinian right of return. It could be technical, but hopefully you'll be able to relate to it. So just a few notes about an introduction. So I'm focusing on a specific right, the ones of Palestinians to return, but this right also applies to many people who have been transferred from their homes, including Lebanese, Syrians, and so forth. So this will be familiar to all of us. The right has been central to the Palestinian, Palestinian struggle since 1948. If you know anything about Palestine, you know the right of return is kind of key to the struggle. And it's still a key to the struggle today. These refugees and their descendants are still waiting for justice. So it's an ongoing tragedy, an ongoing, ongoing call for justice. And my question is, what is the home they want to, can, and ought to return to? So like Alia, I ask questions, and I don't know if I can answer them. But the process, I think, of asking them is already part of the answer. So part of the answer is that we need to rethink the notions of home and homeland. And that's what's very difficult. It is difficult for Palestinians and maybe unacceptable, and I might anger some Palestinian refugees who are here, could be here, is this is also part of the struggle, it's also part of the tragedy of displacement after so many years, is we unfortunately have to rethink home and homeland, or fortunately. Some clarifications before I begin. This is both a historical question, so how have the notions of home and homeland evolved historically and politically since 1948, and it's a question about justice. What home do we have, do they have the right to? What home should they return to? And in what home, homeland, should they be welcomed back to? I cannot answer both. I'll try to answer the first and give glimpses of my answer to the second. But both are equally important. And as an academic, I do not separate the two. I know many academics that do, but I do not separate issues of justice from issues of history and politics. And both obviously are super complicated. And both, and the second especially, is quite taboo in certain contexts. So for Israel, the right of return is a non-starter. Why? Because it simply means their country, understood as an ethnocratic Jewish state, being flooded by Arab refugees. And this means the end of the Jewish state. It means you're an anti-Semite. It means you're calling for a second Holocaust. Therefore, you do not talk about the right of return. In the Western states, well, you know, what Israel said. Although this is a bit more complex, Historically, you know, diplomatically, how, do you, how have Western states talked about the Palestinian right of return? But today, the situation is at a stand. For Arab states, it's also complicated because there's a complicated history with Palestinian refugees. Jordan, 1970s, Black September, Lebanon, Kuwait, Syria now, and so forth. Of course, they call for the right of return, but they also have their own complicated stories with Palestinians. And for Palestinians also, we don't talk much about it because it's sacred. When something is sacred, you don't have to think about what home or homeland mean. You just assume that we all know what it means. I don't think we do, actually. But the sacredness of the right also meant that there's a lack of critical discussion. That's also understandable because the right is being denied. So we spend all our energy struggling to defend the right, but we have no more energy to think what this right really entails and what home we're going to end up in, inshallah. Also, another clarificatory point is I am not a Palestinian refugee. Okay, this has to kind of be clear from the onset. This could be my inner diaspora guilt acting up. It tends to act up in these situations. But it's also important to say because for the last, since the peace process, we've been talking about Palestinian refugees, but never allowing them to talk. They've been completely sidelined from the process. Their story is silenced. We talk about them as numbers, as a problem to be solved, but not as human beings who have rights. So I don't want to partake in the silencing. But I think refugeehood is part of what defines me as a Palestinian. So in that sense, and since I want them back in what I consider to be my homeland, it's also important for me to talk about this. If there's refugeehood in my family, my dad's family stayed in Palestine, they didn't leave. 
it's from my mother's side, and this connects me to Omar and also Ali and some, because my mother's side are Assyrians. They fled the Assyrian genocide along with the Armenian and the Greek genocide at the beginning of the century. And this is my Teta Saide, who's still alive, losing her marbles, but still alive. <laughs> so I've inherited refugeehood from them, but ironically, we've never talked about this in my family. It's almost like a palimpsest. There's, you know, because I grew up in Palestine, there's another story of refugeehood which was much more important. So there was no space for talking about Assyrian refugeehood. Until now, I don't know much. But Omar, I know that my grandma told me that they had a relative, apparently a very beautiful Assyrian that was kidnapped to Mosul. <laughs> and then some Kurdish shepherd helped them bring her back. I don't know how true the story is, <laughs> but this is what I've been told. So this is my connection to Mosul. Okay. Now that I've clarified a bit where I come from, let me tell you how I came to think about this, which is, I think, the sort of the, what I have in mind is an academic article, unfortunately, but it will have also some political interest. Is I, I started thinking about this when I was doing research on Cyprus. So Cyprus, for many of you, is a summer destination for drunken tourists, for the Lebanese in the crowd, it's where you know, intermixed marriages happen. But R Cyprus, <laughs> belonging to our part of the world, is also an island scarred by partition and refugeehood, and dreams of return on both sides, Greek and Turkish, because there's been displacement on both sides. So what happened, there was a peace process in the 2000s, and the border between the two parts of the island opened. And some people returned home, technically returned home. And I was reading, just the, these were accounts of individuals that returned. This was a Greek refugee that returned to northern Cyprus. And he faced the dilemma, and I never thought about this way, because for, as I said, we, for us return is so utopian that we don't think about actual return. So here was this Greek refugee who was happy to return to his neighborhood, even could live in his own house, but he said, how can I return if I'm not at home to the place I return to? And that struck me as an obvious dilemma, but one that I never thought about. What happens when you return? You know, decades of revolution, thawra, the end, world ending, and then you return, it's like, anti-climax, what happens? <laughs> and in the, you know, I, there, these kind of narratives that return also exist in Palestinians. So in the 1990s, also during the peace process, many people returned with European passports. I guess like Alia, who returns to Syria with an American passport. And they also had these narratives of return where they could not find home in their homeland. And there's a wonderful article by Hassan Khadr, this is in the journal of Palestine Studies called Confessions of a Returning, and he says, I did not find my homeland in my homeland. So that is a big problem. So this is a dilemma I think all refugees face. So even Syrians, I'm sure, will face this. And if you're talking only maybe a decade of displacement or five years, or but imagine if this lasts decades, the problem becomes more and more important. How do you call this home? If they kicked you out of your home, how do you make it home again? And that's a big problem. So the struggle for return is one thing, and that's what has occupied Palestinians, because we've been denied this right. But the struggle to return home and find a home is obviously another. So that's the one I'm interested in here today. And my claim is the following, it's, is that you actually really need to think the meanings of home and homeland. It's inescapable. It's part of struggling for the right. And my, this is my claim about justice, and my claim about history is that actually, if you look back, there are two basic conceptions of home at work in the Palestinian right of return. And I'll examine, with you, examine them with you today. First is the home as the individual space, the individual house, and the second is the collective national homeland. And it's the relationship between the two which is complex and has evolved over time. And my conclusion, if I might have not time to explore it, is that both have limits. We've been operating with these two limited distinctions of home and homeland, and both have their limits and their problems. And we need to expand our political imaginations if we struggle for the right return, and we should struggle for the right return. It's not an if. So let's start with the first meaning, the right to the individual home. So this is actually the understanding of the right of return in the United Nations General Assembly Resolution 194, which you probably all heard about. It's the one guaranteeing Palestinians the right of return according to international law. And this was issued right after the Nakba in 1948. 
specifically Article 11 of this resolution, which talks about the right return, it has three components. If you know this, it's just a simple reminder. First is an individual, and I stress individual, right of, to return to one's home. So the resu resu resolution states, refugees wishing to return to their homes and live at peace with their neighbors should be permitted to do so at their earliest practicable, practicable date. So it's a refugee returning to his home. In French, foyer. So it's like your own personal house. Second, it says, if you do not return, you have the right to compensation. And it stresses that th there's responsibility un under international law of the governments who are responsible for their dispersal to pay compensation or allow them to return. It's actually important to stress the, why there's mention of international law, because in 1948, there's two things that happen, the Declaration of Human Rights and the Fourth Geneva Convention. So in 1948, Palestinians are actually, in a way, history saves their ass, because their, their right of return becomes a right according to international law. Sido Borashid, my Assyrian refugee who fled the Ottoman genocides, didn't have that right. So he never had the right to return according to international law. Palestinians, because you know, sometimes we're lucky, sometimes just have this on paper, is that we happen to be expelled at a time when this becomes international law. Not because they like us, but because Europeans a few years before were expelled in masses and the international community had to rewrite international law to protect civilians and their right to return. So we could thank World War II for that in a very horrible, ironic way. Now, this is actually, today, this is one of the most controversial resolutions in the peace process. May it rest in peace. Anyone who supports the Palestinian right of return or Resolution 194 today will be called an extremist. You know, that's the, you're the radical fringe of the Palestine if you support the right of return. You're not, by the way, but this is how it's considered. And actually, in 1948, it was equally controversial, but for the exact opposite reasons. And we tend to forget this, me including. If you, I had to make you guess which states signed for Resolution 194 and which states voted against, you would not believe it. Those who were for, Australia, UK, Israel, uh, no, Israel didn't exist yet, I mean, according to the UN, France, Norway, all the Western states were for Resolution 194. They all voted for it. Who voted against? Lebanon, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Syria, Soviet Union, all the progressive social states, so forth. Now, for us, it's strange, given that today the resolution in the United States is taboo. You know, tr Trump now is trying to destroy anything related to Palestinian refugees. But at the time, that's what the Palestinian condition, uh, situation was diplomatically. Only resolution 194 and 181. And the PLO would only referred to Resolution 194 in the 1990s. And you're like, wait, how? Is this supposed to be central to the Palestinian struggle. Why did they wait till the 1990s? Did Arafat not read the resolution and took all his time? No, there are ideological reasons why he did not accept it. So it's only starting in 88 and then explicitly in the 90s. So why was it rejected when today it is the, th the thing we defend as hard as we can? It's because the resolution guarantees only an individual right to a home, not a right to return to a homeland. So there was a different understanding of homeland at work that was not approved by the resolution. So let's move to the second meaning of home, which is the return to the national homeland. So with the creation of the Palestinian Liber Liberation Organization in 64, you have a new understanding of home that emerges. It's already championed by Arab nationalists, but not in this way. The PLO is really the one that stresses on the uniqueness also of the Palestinian case, together with this pan-Arabic nature. So home here is the national homeland, and return means return is liberation through armed struggle. It's not individual return guaranteed by the UN, it's armed struggle to liberate a national homeland. So the PLO rejected Resolution 194 because it reduced Palestinians to refugees and the Palestinian cause to humanitarian one. That was the main reason why the PLO rejected 194. We are not an object of international charity. We are subjects of right. So to, just to give you an understanding of how much the PLO hated being reduced to refugees, I want to just quote a short section from Les Khoury's wonderful Bab shams Hard reading, I'm not gonna lie, but wonderful nonetheless. So, the whole book is structured around a dialogue or a monologue between Khalil and his comatose father, an aging Palestinian revolutionary. Just before I move on, I want to say, like, isn't this the metaphor of all the Arab states? Like, 
Aren't we all having some kind of monologue dialogue with the comatose revolutionary past? <laughs> Just like, there's something wonderful about the metaphor which, you know, bears stressing. <laughs> I definitely have this monologue, even in my sleep. So, okay, let's <laughs> return to, to Yas Khoury. And, and this really illustrates how the PLO saw the refugees. So Khalil says to Yunus, as they were setting up tents, that wind blows through from both sides. You said to them, we're not refugees. We're fugitives and nothing more. We fight and kill and are killed, but we're not refugees. You told the people that refugees meant something shameful and that the road to all the villages of the Galilee was open. Being reduced to refugee was shameful. You do not call yourself a refugee or you do not reduce yourself to refugee. You are a refugee, but you are returning, and you are returning through the struggle. So, and this meant a, a direct re rejection of Resolution 194. You all can tell me when I'm like close to one minute? Oh, wonderful. Okay, well, I'll, I can end with this and then. So it rejected the individual right to return. So if you return as an individual, you return to live in peace with Israel. That's treason. If you accepted money in exchange, bayi treason. Palestinians are not refugees demanding charity, sorry, they're objects of political rights. There's also rejection of what home meant for these individuals. We were not returning to old homes and old social relations that were characterized by colonial relations, feudal, bourgeois, patriarchal. For the PLO, in principle and on paper, again, <laughs> we were returning to the future. And Edward Said really captures this in a quote where he says, the Palestinian predicament since 48 has been to live in a utopia, a non-place of some sort. We're returning to a new home. We're not returning to the old ways. You gotta love that part, at least, of the PLO. So what happens later on is, and this, this is where I don't have much time, but there's compromise. Palestinians accept a limited home and return and a limited homeland. Then came the Oslo peace process. <laughs> and the PLO accepts UN resolutions. So now we accept the idea like that's the solution. It's like we will accept a limited homeland in the West Bank and Gaza and individual rights of return in Israel. That's, that's the, officially what we have on paper. But of course, there was no return to, no limited homeland and no limited return and no rights to either. So now we're stuck in a sort of limbo. Okay, I was trying to conclude, but I, I mean, the conclusion is that we're stuck now with all these discourses. We use everything. We have individual right of return, collective right of return, limited homeland, collective homeland, thawra, Islamic homeland, and we're very, very, very confused. I, and unfortunately for the Palestinians, we were very confused. So we need to recenter the struggle about what home means and what homeland means in order to defend our right to return. Thank you. <laughs>